All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the NOAA Central Library and the Technology Partnerships Office for this installment of the NOAA Innovator Series. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them in the questions panel. And if you have any issues, please send us a chat. I'm Erin Cheever, I'm a librarian at the NOAA Central Library. This seminar is going to be facilitated by Vince Garcia, the SBIR Program Manager, and I'm going to turn things over to him. Uh, good. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for this week's uh, Innovators Brown Bag Lunch. Um, my name is Vince Garcia, as Aaron said. I am the SBIR, the Small Business Innovation Research Program Manager. Um, and the program itself is a federal program that provides federal funds to domestic for-profit small business uh, in the United States uh, for them to provide innovative solutions to NOAA mission-related areas. Uh, one such innovative technology is the one that you will be hearing from today, the, the uh, enhanced marine weather awareness using crowdsource observation for mobile devices. And the, the small business company's name is Criari. Criari has developed an Android iOS smartphone app, uh, Weather Citizen, I believe is what it's called, uh, for collecting and distributing crowdsourced environmental observations in a marine environment. In collaboration with Stony Brook University, we recently performed a, a field trial of Weather Citizen on Long Island Sound, collecting observations from 10 plus geospatially distributed mobile devices and disseminating data-driven insights in real time. This presentation, this presentation will provide overview of, of the development and deployment of Weather Citizen, an overview of the Long Island Sound field trial and the roadmap of Weather Citizen into the future. Uh, presenting today is Mark Shapiro and uh, Jerry Biashet. I think I said that right. Uh, Jerry B is the principal investigator of this no SBR phase two effort. At Criari, Dr. B leads a wide range of projects investigating the use of mobile devices as crowdsourced and observational platforms, serverless cloud computing for earth science data anal analytics, and scientific and geospatial software design and development. Mark Shapiro, on the other hand, is the lead software architect for this no SBR phase two effort. Mr. Shapiro is the lead software developer on multiple projects aimed at providing mobile-based tools for data collection, aggregation and distribution. These efforts include a flexible cross-platform mobile framework for administering hearing assessments and training and an Android-based platform for crowdsourcing local environmental conditions based on mobile device sensors. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Shapiro and Jerry B. Pass that over to you guys. Thanks, Vince. I just wanted to make sure that you can see our screen and hear me. I'm going to take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, Jerry B. Um, I'm going to speak first, and and my colleague Mark Shapiro as well will will follow up in the presentation. So uh, agenda for today's talk. I'll start with an uh, introduction uh, to the overall effort, and then uh, we'll provide an overview of the Weather Citizen app. We'll provide a summary of results from our first field trial which took place uh, this past June. We'll describe other use cases for the Weather Citizen app. Uh, we'll describe some of the system details of our technical implementation and uh, give an overview of future work and of course leave time for discussion at the end. So in terms of the introduction, um, motivation is that uh, accurate marine weather nowcasts and forecasts are critical to maintain situational awareness and ensure safe navigation. However, uh, existing marine weather observations, which are required for this, are sparse. Um, it's nothing like terrestrial observation where you have a, a high density of, of weather stations and, and other modes of observations. Rather, um, in a marine environment, for example, on the bottom left, you have NOAA buoys, which provide um, high uh, temporal um, and even spatial in, in close proximity to coastal regions. But, but again, it's, it's uh, very sparse coverage. Uh, far from shore. Um, likewise, uh, human observations from participants in the VOS program are more widely dispersed. Um, however, you still have large gaps in both spatial and temporal coverage. So the uh, need identified uh, by NOAA in SBIR topic 8.2.6 back in uh, 2017 
This was a topic put together by um, Jay Albrecht, who before his retirement this past spring was a marine weather forecaster at uh, National Weather Service in Seattle, Washington. And that topic identified a need to develop a smartphone-based platform for marine weather observations, which would involve a crowdsourced approach to improve the density of observations, as well as integration with social media to share those observations in real time. And the potential benefits would be increased spatial and temporal density of marine weather observations. And these observations could be then used to improve situational awareness and marine safety, safety and also improve uh, environmental prediction models. So our solution to this problem is depicted here. Uh, as Vince mentioned, it's, it's called Weather Citizen. The Weather Citizen platform has two key elements. The first element is the smartphone app for collecting data. And the second element is the, the backbone uh, for sharing that data. And so uh, top half of this graphic uh, describes some of the capabilities of the smartphone app. We collect data using three different modalities. The first, is, uh, the first modality is via manual entry by the user of text, audio, and or images describing the observation. The second modality is through automated polling of the phone's internal sensors. For example, near, nearly every um, smartphone has a, a, a barometer, um, a microphone, and an accelerometer, and, and Mark will later describe how such sensors can be used to infer not only barometric pressure, but also other conditions such as sea state or wind speed. Uh, the app also integra integrates with external weather stations and sensors via Bluetooth. Um, uh, specifically, uh, the current version of the app integrates with two different versions of the Kestrel weather meters. And then any of the data, however it's collected either, either manually on board or external sensors, that data is geotagged, timestamped, and buffered on the phone um, until network connectivity is, is available. And the bottom half of this graphic describes the, the elements of data sharing. Uh, data from the app are automatically uploaded um, uh, when they're collected, if, if network connectivity is available or, or when that connectivity is restored to our cloud-based server. That server can deliver maps and data to any internet device. That server is called, uh, the URL for that is weather, weathercitizen.org. Uh, the app is also integrated uh, with, uh, directly with Twitter uh, for sharing observations on social media. And the, the ultimate goal is, again, to use that data to improve marine, marine weather forecast. And we're uh, proud to say that we're now officially have released the app on both um, the Apple, IO, um, the Apple um, uh, iOS store, the App Store, uh, as well as Google Play for installation on Android devices. We uh, encourage everyone to, if interested, to go to your respective App Store and uh, download Weather Citizen, give it a, 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 a try and, and, and let us know what you think. Um, and before handing it over to Mark, I just want to acknowledge the other uh, members of our project team. Uh, we're supported by another half dozen engineers here, here at Criari involved in application um, development, data analysis, as well as uh, uh, testing of the app. We're also collaborating with Professor Brian Colley at Stony Brook University, who is, uh, he and his students are working on not only testing, evaluating the app, but also uh, performing research on how these smartphone-based observations could be used for data assimilation within uh, numerical forecast models. So now I'll uh, hand it over to Mark, who will continue with a description of Weather Citizen. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, we, we put the URL here, weathercitizen.org. This is uh, the main landing page for the project. It has more information. And you'll see I've tried to include uh, web links throughout the presentation. So when this is shared afterwards, um, you can follow us back through, through uh, the actual live links. So as Jerry described, um, the main, the cornerstone of this project is, a, is an application, a cross-platform application. And um, the goal here was to allow users to collect data in the means that makes the most sense to them. Um, 
manual inputs is the way that a lot of projects have chosen to collect uh, environmental data. So this means you, you pull open the app, you select to make a manual observation, and you can take an image, you can record audio, you can input uh, qualitative or quantitative data and uh, submit an observation uh, at a random time. Um, we've enabled users to customize input fields. Um, as the project has gone on, we've had many requests to add specific input fields and we just decided uh, we'd like to make it so that you can record data that's relevant to you. So this is in addition to the weather and environmental conditions. Uh, we also felt it was really important for users to be able to passively record data. Um, this would be um, if you are uh, working or you, you're unable to actually be recording uh, observations in real time, but you're still really interested to know, uh, you know, what is the pressure along my route? What is the um, sea state along my route? Uh, so you can be recording data consistently in the background all the way down to 100 milliseconds in frequency. Um, and this also uh, relates to the uh, Bluetooth sensors. So you can be recording external sensor data. Um, the goal here being to, to make the framework more applicable to different research studies as they come up. Um, those observations are uploaded to our backend server. And then through the app, you're also able to see a what we're calling a feed of observations. So based on your device's location, you will see the nearest observations, forecasts, and advisories in your area. Um, and so this looks a lot like other social media uh, projects that uh, are out there. You, from top to bottom, it's the most recent to the most old, and it shows you who's posting that uh, element of the feed and how long ago and how far away it is from you. Um, and this is this is really nice so that if you're out on the water um, and you uh, are interested to know okay what's going around going on around me you can see both NOAA's advisories and other people's observations all together um, that's also visible on a map so if you're more of a visual person you'd rather not see it in time you'd like to see it in space you can view the same same feed on your map um, as Jerry mentioned, part of the original goal of this uh, SBIR topic was to integrate uh, technical observations with the social media platforms that are out there. Um, so we chose to start with Twitter. Um, and and uh, so we allow Weather Citizen to uh, integrate with personal Twitter accounts. Um, and if you authorize Weather Citizen to use your Twitter account, it can push observations directly to Twitter and uh, geotag them and apply a consistent hashtag. Um, and this can then be ingested by uh, NOAA's own algorithms for uh, forecasting. Um, we can talk about that more if, if people are interested. The main way that users can visualize their own data is to go to our web map. Um, so currently this web map pulls data from all devices and uh, shows all observations that are geotagged. Um, and it allows you to view and download historical data. So you can look over time and see uh, where has my device been, where has other, what are other devices in the area. Uh, you can click on a certain device and plot time series data for your current time window. Um, we've also included uh, observations from all the NOAA data buoys on the same map. So um, we intend to continue to add data sources to the map that are relevant to uh, marine observers. And so you're seeing aggregated data that's not only weather citizen devices, but other data that's very relevant to you. So this is the main visualization and data interface for uh, non-technical users. So as a, as a a little animation of how you might use this. I have a picture. Uh, this is actually a picture I took just a few weeks ago, uh, sea kayaking. And I thought it was a good example because there was quite a big weather event happening in front of me. Um, and so you would be in your kayak, you'd say, oh, that's a really interesting thing going on across the bay. Uh, I'm gonna make an observation of that in case uh, somebody else 
five miles up the bay is interested to see this. Um, that gets uploaded to our server and put on the web map. Um, and then somebody nearby uh, would see that observation come down um, and be able to interact with it, make their own observation. So now we'll talk a little bit about the field trial that we performed. Uh, so this was in collaboration with Brian Colley at Stony Brook and uh, his students. Um, we decided to uh, take a bunch of observations from many different devices across Long Island Sound. Um, and the goal of this was to have the first evaluation of weather citizen in the wild. So we wanted to collect weather system data um, and to assess the impact on forecasting models. So this, the data that we collect would be useful to Brian and his students um, in developing uh, data assimilation models that actually use crowdsourced observations. Uh, we wanted to test the Weather Citizen app and the server under a, a higher usage scenario, and then get feedback from real users uh, on the usability out in the field. Um, we always find it's much harder uh, to type in observations or even use a digital interface when your fingers are cold and you're out on a boat. Um, so over the day, we had 12 observers in the Long Island Sound. Uh, we used commuter ferries and research vessels and shore locations to, to cross a wide spatial area. These two maps show you uh, the map interface from that day. So you can see um, there was one group uh, moving from Bridgeport to uh, Port, Jefferson. Port Jefferson on the west side there. And then our group went from New London to Orient Point and back, and then from New London out to Block Island and back. And we were taking uh, data from many, many devices uh, at a very high frequency, which is why the density is much higher on the right there. Throughout the day, we took um, many pictures. So that's what you can see there on the right. Uh, and if you're interested to explore this data on the map, um, you can click on the map link later on once the slides are distributed. A couple pictures from the day. Uh, we brought a kestrel and a tripod with us um, and set it up on the back of the ferry. Uh, we attached a mobile device to the tripods. So we're taking data right next to the kestrel. Um, and as you can see, there was quite a bit of fog. Um, we spent much of the day inside of the fog uh, with visibility about 50 meters. Um, what I found really exciting and interesting is that as we moved across the bay, we started getting uh, National Weather Service advisories, um, and we were able to see other observations uh, in our weather feed that showed fog at differing levels. So this really gets at the, the goal of the project, which is to improve your situational awareness. If you can see that the fog is lifting from uh, 30 kilometers away, that might make you change how you react uh, in a given weather event. We collected over 2,500 observations throughout the day, um, and we were, we were lucky enough that uh, cellular data service was available at all locations on the water. Uh, that's been a question that there's been a little research on, how far off the, off the coastline can you go and still have cell data connections, and it turns out with with the direct line of sight, um, you can actually go pretty far. Um, so we've developed the system to work uh, completely offline, but through the field trial, we discovered that uh, in many cases, it's actually uh, totally connected uh, even while you're on the water. As Jerry alluded to, uh, part, of, part of this project has been to use the cellular data, uh, use the phone observations to create advanced data products. Um, so not just uh, pressure, distributed pressure and temperature data from cell devices, but what else can a cell phone uh, give, give us just based on those sensor measurements? So one, one observation we've been trying to develop a data product for is wind speed. Um, and we have a wind speed algorithm that operates on high frequency pressure measurements from a singular mobile device. Um, and so we, we had five devices going in various places on the boat near the Kestrel, using the Kestrel as our uh, ground truth source. 
And this just shows the, the uh, barometric pressure measurements uh, of all those devices as we went throughout the day. After uh, analyzing those pressure measurements and applying our algorithm, we found that we were able to predict the true wind speed relatively accurately above five meters per second. Um, below five meters per second, the noise uh, in the sensor measurements of the pressure is just too high. Uh, what the right graph shows is that in general, we're predicting uh, a higher wind speed than you'd actually uh, expect. And that makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're, uh, we're overestimating when, when the signal is really low, but once the wind speed gets to be a bit higher, we're actually quite accurate. Uh, in the future versions of the app, we're going to have a procedure built in for making a wind speed measurement. Um, this is unfortunately not a measurement that we're able to automate just now, but uh, we're able to have a, a procedure that someone could follow that would be able to take a pressure measurement in about 20 seconds. Uh, also, as part of the effort, we've been trying to uh, create an algorithm to measure sea state. Um, so we applied our sea state algorithms to the data collected on the ferry, uh, and we were able to determine a, a wave period of about two and a half seconds. And while we don't have a ground truth source for that, uh, it's encouraging um, that all the devices uh, predicted a similar wave period. And uh, we're in the process of developing some experiments to actually validate our model um, in, in a experiment. Uh, of course, this, the, to be able to determine wave height, uh, the vessel has to be small enough not to impose its own transfer function. Um, so we're continuing to experiment with the wave height part of the algorithm, uh, but it'll be more applicable to kayaks and small fishing boats, uh, vessels that are are, are much smaller relative to the wave. Uh, as part of the event, we got a lot of feedback from our users, which was very helpful for the user interface. Um, so this slide just gives an overview of changes we're currently making to make the app a lot more useful. Um, when you open the app in the future, it's gonna have a big make an observation button right at the top. Some of the feedback we received was that uh, observations were hard to actually make, hard to find where to make them. Um, we're going to make the input screen a lot simpler. We found that uh, we would never actually make many of the quantitative inputs. Really, you open a manual observation, you want to take a photo, click on the kind of weather it is, maybe type some notes and submit. Um, we'll hide the additional inputs down below. And then once you make an input, we're going to show you the map right away. Um, currently, this just brings you back to the main screen with the feed, but uh, most of our users are really interested to see the observation they've taken across that day and multiple days. Um, so these are just a few changes. Uh, so the, the application is still under heavy development, and we look forward to making it more applicable to a much wider audience. So as part of the project, uh, we've created a user forum um, to try and encourage uh, a wider user base and have people share their stories about how they're, they're using the application. Um, so we're going to take you to our user forum here and walk you through a couple of our user stories. Um, we encourage users that are on, on this uh, webinar that are excited about the project to download the app. Uh, sign up for a uh, forum account and, and give us feedback and, and write about your stories that uh, are relevant to you. That will help us make the application system more relevant. So uh, this shows a couple of what I would call off-label uses of the application, but uh, have been pretty exciting to us because of the different data sets you can create. Um, something that is I'm very excited about is uh, ski touring um, up in New Hampshire. So I wrote uh, a little right up here with a with a map link, which uh, brings you to um, the map with some pictures of the day, um, showing about how weather season can be used to track snowpack and, and ski touring lines, uh, a lot like Strava would be for uh, tracking your workout. Uh, we have one of our uh, developers here who is uh, developing machine learning algorithms for, for the images that are uploaded. Um, so we have 
a uh, an example of how you can see the cloud cover and the weather labels that we predict for your images um, using the map and i'll go through that in a little more detail in just a moment um, one of our users is an oyster fisherman down in alabama um, and he's very excited about being able to track the salinity in the water and uh, the environmental conditions of his oyster farm so he uh, shared with us a, a little write-up that we've included here uh, about how he's using the application. Um, Jerry has written up his experience of using the application with Twitter. So you've been tweeting every morning. Yep, never tweeted before, but now I'm a tweeter with Weather Citizen. Um, I try a few times a week, uh, try to do a, either an observation from my backyard or in the summer from our cottage. And uh, when I take that observation, the app gives me the option to push that to Twitter. And I do that and uh, get to go, go in Twitter and, and look up the hashtag and kind of see a history on, on Twitter of those postings. So um, we think that we, it's an exciting sort of uh, capability, I, I think, um, as, as we start to adopt more users. Um, as part of our uh, algorithm development here, uh, we've set up a weather station uh, on the roof of our building and we set up a uh, parallel uh, fake weather station that has a phone on it uh, with a battery pack. Um, so we have a little write up here about comparing the, uh, the data that's coming off our Vantage Pro 2 weather station with uh, Weather Citizen on a homemade weather vane. Um, one of our other engineers here has been taking the, the application up into the White Mountains and uh, showing the altitude and pressure measurements as he's walking. Uh, and he's been taking pictures to depict the mountain weather, um, which is obviously changing very quickly. Uh, the White Mountains is known as being a, a difficult place to predict weather. So we think a uh, weather citizen could be very useful to people who are looking for conditions at different elevations. Um, we have a, a write-up about uh, the hurricane coming in from the south. So uh, part, of our, part of our map capability is seeing the NOAA data buoy time series. And you can have multiple math, maps where you're looking at pressure, wind speed, wind direction, and wave height all at the same time. Um, so this is not a, a super analytical way of, of uh, analyzing data, but it's a great way to start seeing trends between different sensors. Uh, finally, we have our uh, a write up about the data collection field trial here. Um, so as you can see, a lot of these write ups are uh, Criari generated as of now. Um, we're very excited for others to start using the system and, and letting us know uh, how they see their, their use case. Um, we included a, included static shots of this in case the uh, internet didn't work here, but we seem to be okay. Um, so we're about 30 minutes in. Uh, I'm going to go through just a few system details, uh, maybe about five minutes more here, and then we'll open this up to questions. Um, we have a lot of slides here at the back which go through more of the system details, um, and we can come back to these if. Uh, if users are, or, or listeners here are, are interested in hearing them, uh, but we'd love to hear from you guys more than uh, just talking at you for the rest of the hour. Um, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to crowdsourcing. Um, this is a figure we put together to show how a system like this, uh, all the different pieces need to work together. So obviously you have the interface where you need to curate the inputs that uh, you're collecting. You have to incentivize people to actually collect data. Um, that's something that we haven't delved into greatly yet, um, but having it pushed to a user social media feed is a one way of incentivizing uh, users to actually make observations. You need the, the data aggregation infrastructure. So this is the server and the database. Um, you need to have quality control and data validation algorithms. As you can imagine, uh, cell phone observations from users uh, can be very messy. Um, and so we have a few algorithms on the database side for quality control and validation. Um, you need to control data access 
privacy and interoperability. This is something we care really deeply about. Um, we do not want to be developing this system to serve advertisements to people. Uh, we want this to be a, a service that's primarily useful to researchers and um, outdoor enthusiasts. Um, so we're currently uh, running the system as totally open um, it without, so if you, if you do choose to download the application and upload data, just know that currently there are no uh, guards on, on who can access data from the map. But in the future, uh, we would like to make it so that uh, data could be uh, behind it and access walls so that um, it's not it's not totally wide open. Um, once once all that data is on the server, you want to be able to wrangle it and harmonize it with other data source data sources out or out there like the NOAA data buoys. And, and finally, um, you want to create data products with those with those pieces. Um, a lot you know a lot of people in the crowdsourcing world assume that crowdsource data speaks for itself. Um, and I, I think that is a incorrect uh, philosophy that really there's, you have to generate the data products and the insights from crowdsourced data before it's really useful. So this can be the map, this could be a uh, image recognition algorithm, um, but, but we want to be encouraging uh, users of this system to go right to, um, the ability to create their own data products and insets. So this is that same chart with the pieces of Weather Citizen that we've developed. So obviously we've talked a lot about today, the cross-platform mobile application. Uh, we have a REST server with a geospatial database. So we've used a couple of open source products to develop a, a server that has an open API. Um, its data is stored in a Mongo database um, and is accessible through the Python E framework. Um, our API is uh, um, adheres to the open API standards so that you can use tools to actually investigate the API and, and, and figure out how to get data through it. Um, and we've created the web map and some data processing libraries in MATLAB and Python to make it easier for researchers uh, and people who would like to get at their actual data to download it and play with it. Um, I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides. We have a couple of details on, on the server um, and how we're actually processing and filtering that data. Uh, I think the most important piece to mention here is that we are geospatially and temporally indexing all the data so we can support uh, geospatial queries through the API. And we're able to dynamically validate data. So um, the data that gets posted from devices all gets stored equally. But then when you choose to get that data, we can subset and filter based on the user doing, making the API. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the we're developing advanced data products, particularly wind speed. Um, so we've done testing in our wind tunnel here with the Kestrel, um, and we're also developing algorithms for sea state um, using the accelerometer and the uh, gravitational sensor. Um, we have two image recognition models currently um, that are in development. Uh, one is for cloud cover and another is for weather labels. Um, so here's two examples with the links um, to see the raw data that comes out of those algorithms. Um, we were just looking at this a little bit earlier and we found that uh, some of the data from earlier today, so here we are in New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, Creary is based in Hanover, New Hampshire. So we're taking some observations here. Um, if you click on an image, you can see the image, the raw image in full. Um, and to, to run the uh, machine learning model, we have some specific endpoints. Um, so this is our cloud cover prediction. Um, so this is actually running on demand. When I called that URL, that image was pushed through our machine learning model and uh, the data comes back and I apologize here, it's in a pretty raw form, but you can see that we're predicting the cloud cover is about 75% in this image. Um, so this is the kind of work we would like to continue um, to develop uh, in, the, in the next 10 months of this project. Uh, to make these endpoints a little more accessible to users and a little more integrated into the system. 
Uh, we're also in, in development, we're trying to take those uh, image recognition models and actually de derive C-state just from images. Um, the NOAA data buoys provide a very rich data set. Uh, we have over 6 million images collected now um, from the NDBC system of uh, images and C-state. So we're hoping we can develop a model there that would uh, help drive C-state just from a single image. I'm going to skip through the tools. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a website, weathercitizen.org, which gives more information. Uh, the website has documentation, um, easily accessible, and we also have our user forum. So we encourage everyone to, to please uh, access those resources. So where is this project going? Uh, we have 10 months left on our NOAA SBIR phase two grant. Um, one of our main focuses is to work with Stony Brook uh, to demonstrate crowdsourced marine observations in data assimilation models. Um, so we've collected data on our field trial day. That's gonna be the main data set uh, for Brian and his students to run a data assimilation experiment. Um, and we want to determine if and how crowdsourced marine observations can be useful in an operational model. model. Um, there's a chance that uh, depending on where those observations are, they're much less useful. Uh, if they're already close to a bunch of weather stations, it's less useful than if they're out in the middle of the ocean where there aren't many stations already. So we wanna learn more about how these observations can be integrated. Um, we want to integrate with more hardware, um, so uh, there's a, a parallel NOAA SBIR phase two project happening here at Criari to develop an open source water monitoring system. Um, so that is going to be a Bluetooth peripheral that works with Weather Citizen as the primary data management system. Uh, and we're also working on two external uh, Bluetooth sensors for monitoring air quality. Um, and so we're hoping in the future we have a much richer set of external Bluetooth sensors uh, that can participate in this ecosystem. Um, we will be presenting at uh, conferences coming up in the future. Uh, we've submitted an ab abstract to AMS in Boston. Uh, if there's anyone on, the, on this webinar who will be there, uh, we look forward to seeing you. Um, We've connected with other crowdsourcing projects in Finland and France. Uh, obviously, many uh, organizations, national weather organizations, are excited about using crowdsourced observations, uh, and we're discussing in some kind of international consortium to manage crowdsourced data amongst different countries. Um, but primarily, we're, we're really interested in getting early adopters to provide uh, testing and feedback and, and and to help us figure out how to make the system more relevant to real users out in the field. And, and not only for marine weather observations, but as Mark called them, off-label off -label uses. <laughs> um, I found some cool ways to use the app while snowmobiling um, and uh, certainly interested in, in what folks come up with. So in summary, um, We've developed the Weather Citizen software framework for crowdsourcing marine weather observations. We demonstrated the framework with our first field trial in June. Uh, currently, we are refining algorithms to help provide more advanced insights from Weather Citizen to directly to users, uh, and specifically focusing here on non-technical users. Uh, we're working with Stony Brook to in integrate Weather Citizen data into forecast models, and we're excited to to work with uh, NOAA and others to test and, and get more feedback on the system. Um, so at this point, we will uh, open up the open up the seminar to questions. Um, I put a couple of uh, links here. Uh, Jerry and I are both available via email uh, if you have specific questions after that you'd like like to talk about. Thank you, Mark and Jerry. This is Aaron again, and we do have some online questions um, coming in. So I'll uh, read those off. Um, someone had a suggestion that your next study could be in the Bering Sea. Um, I don't know if you've considered that at all. But. That sounds very exciting. 
um, and then is, is, yeah, yeah. is there a reason that the Bering Sea would be a, a good place for our next study? Uh, so I think this um, same person also shared with us that uh, they're interested in um, getting a copy of the presentation and sharing it with their marine focal points in Alaska. Great. Yeah, that would be that would be excellent. I, I think the link on the brown bag is going to be a video, but if somebody wants um, a PDF, uh, you have our emails on this slide right here that's being displayed. Let us know and we can forward those to you. Fantastic. Um, and then another question we had uh, would be if you're able to estimate sea state and wind using the Beaufort scale visual phenomena. Um, she, you, for the Beaufort scale is for wind speed, correct? And sea state. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Eric is here, one of our engineers who's been working on the sea state model. One of the challenges is, is ground truth. And so what we've, whenever you're doing machine learning, people will all tell you, how do you train the data? And um, really the, the Beaufort scale would require an expert to manually label those images a portion of those images that we could train the machine learning algorithms. So at this point, we don't have that label data available. Rather, we've just been relying on what uh, is available from, from the buoy sensors. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then another question was um, if the back end server is connected to MADIS. It is not. Um, currently, it, it's it's a, it's a standalone uh, server. Um, we, we we haven't really considered connecting with Matus um, to date, um, given uh, you know the the appropriate motivation and, and ideas. I'd love to, to talk to somebody about doing that. Okay, um, and then another question, kind of in the same line, was um, how are the observations being relayed to the National Weather Service? So currently, um, they're, they're, uh, the, the original um, idea that, that, as Jay articulated, was uh, National Weather Service is using something called TweetDeck to um, review Twitter postings um, with certain hashtags and keywords, um, uh, you know, basically to try to, f f you know, find extreme weather events that people are, are tweeting about. And so right now, um, you know, there's there's a certain has, hashtag used by um, Weather Citizen app where one could search for that hashtag. Our, our tweets are also geospatially tagged, and so one could limit the search space for those. There's currently no operational use at NWS, um, but we're hoping to build toward toward that capability. Okay, great. And we do uh, actually have a lot of questions coming in. So um, another one that we had is uh, my staff and I work with marine recreational fishers, attending sport fish shows, talking with them on docks. This app seems like something those constituents might be interested in. Although they might not want their fishing locations shared, can this be turned off? Um, what what would that so so currently um, Currently, you can um, elect to uh, include uh, your your geospatial location or not in your Twitter post. Uh, that is an option. However, right now, the data that's pushed to the server is geotagged. So, as 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 Mark mentioned, right now that information would be shared. Um, uh, but but it, it, these are the kind of use use cases and situations that we certainly are interested in talking to people about. So, so the system works, if you turn the GPS of your phone off, you can still collect data. The only problem then is uh, we can't show that data on a map. Uh, we don't really have any way of knowing what to do with it. Um, and so we've tried, uh, you know, if you collect data with, with GPS for a little while, and then you turn it off, and then you collect more data, and then again, you turn it back on, we can interpolate between those points, at which we do on the map, but um, I think it'd be interesting to hear, you know, what is the limit on 
on uh, location from those people? Like, would it be okay if we knew their location within a kilometer, or is it tens of kilometers? At some point, it becomes less relevant from a situational awareness perspective if you don't actually know where the observation is coming from. But it also raises the greater issue of privacy. And this is something we wrestled with a lot early in the project. And then we, we basically came to the decision that we were going to make the data available. Um, and if you, if, you, if you use the app, um, that you're basically consenting to sharing that, that location and that information. Um, and, and that's our baseline approach. But, but in the future, I'm sure that will evolve. OK, great. Thank you for that. Um, another timeable question. If there's a BT sensor connect for hydrography? Say that one more time. Uh, they're looking for a Bluetooth sensor connection. For hygrography? The high uh, humidity, I believe. Ah, ah, hygrometer. Yeah. Um, yes, the Kestrel has a relative uh, humidity sensor on it. So uh, currently, you could use the Kestrel 5500 weather meter. Um, the Kestrel drop may also have RH on it. Um, and if you can find a Samsung 4, it also has a <laughs> relative humidity sensor. Right. Yeah. right, the Samsung S4 mobile device, you can probably get it for $20 on eBay right now. Uh, actually, is a great weather heater. <laughs> yeah, it has a, it's, it's the only phone that had uh, relative humidity as well as uh, external temperature sensor, not just an internal battery temperature sensor. All right. Um, next question, the World Meteorological Organization could be a good source to help with other early adopters to provide testing and feedback. So that was more of a suggestion. Thank you. We will look into that. You heard all that, right? Uh, and then another person had just asked um, if you had considered uh, bio slash species reporting with your data collection. What, what, what type of reporting? Uh, species reporting, and I think they had a link that they shared that might have more information. Um, if you, you can uh, feel free to look at that later as well. So, so in terms of other types of observations, yeah, like animal sightings. Yeah, yeah, and so um, this is something Mark uh, alluded to earlier about. Um, you know, early on, people were testing the app and say, well, what about this field? For example, salinity. Can you add a field for salinity? Can you add a field for this? Um, and you can certainly create your own fields in the app that are specific to your application that don't even have to have anything to do with weather. And you can take photos and you can record audio. And, um, and so it could be extended toward other environmental modeling, um, invasive species, um, animal sightings, uh, uh, marine debris, um, things like that. OK. Um... And then another comment, uh, someone had proposed that they think the Coast Guard should be approached uh, about being an adopter to test this. Yeah, uh, we'd be really excited to work with the Coast Guard. We've also been directed to uh, the U.S. Boat Organization, Boat U.S., um, which is like AAA for boaters. Um, so we're excited about exploring both of those options from a uh, from the organizations that are in charge of uh, helping boaters with safety. So, you know, if you break down or, or uh, you know, get into trouble, I think those people would be uh, very relevant to a system like this if they could be uh, more in touch with uh, the awareness of other people in an area. And, and also, um, if, if folks have specific points of contact at any of these organizations that are suggested, please let us know. Um, a lot of times you got to, you know, approach 20 different people at an organization to find the, the person who actually cares um, enough to, to engage with you um, and, and to help focus our, our efforts in identifying those people. If you have a specific point of contact that you're willing to share, uh, we'd appreciate it. I agree. And uh, so next question would just be, um, what tools do you use to develop the mobile app? I'm assuming the use of a cross-platform tool, e.g. PhoneGap, Xamarin, something else. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Uh, we do. We use um, what 
Apache Cordova, which is the, the newer version of PhoneGap or the new iteration. Um, and we're actually even using a framework on top of that that's called the Ionic framework. Um, Ionic wraps uh, Apache Cordova and uh, a user interface framework called Angular. Um, so we, we do leverage Ionic to build a mobile application. We had to develop a custom uh, libraries for both Java and iOS that actually get sensor readings from the devices. So there is a little piece that we've done in the native layer for both uh, operating systems, but the user interface is through Ionic. And then um, someone had a troubleshooting question. They said that they just downloaded the app and it tells me that geolocation is unavailable. How do I turn that on? Um, so that, that will be device specific. So when the, the first time uh, it tried to access geolocation, it should have asked if, if you grant permission or not. Um, and if you hit yes, then you should be all set. Uh, if you accidentally said no, then usually you need to go into your settings for that app and grant the permission for the app to access geolocation. The other possibility is that you're in a basement somewhere and you don't have any network uh, connectivity from which GPS location can be inferred, and, and you might try going outside. Um, but certainly, let us know if that problem doesn't resolve. Okay. Uh, next question, is it possible to manually put marine web observations in the app now? That would be handy for us in Alaska. So, say that one more time, sorry. Yep, sorry. Um, is it possible to manually put marine web observations in the app right now? That would be handy for people in Alaska. Yes. Um, so you can you can add any number of fields that you want to the app right now. So you go to the, the Observe tab and click on Customize. Um, and you can actually even specify units if it's a quantitative observation. Um, and all that data will be stored queryable in the database, uh, same as our other quantitative observations now. Uh, if that person wants to email uh, me or Jerry, we'd be happy to, to spend 10 minutes going through how to do that. Okay, great. And then the person with the geolocation app problem just said that restarting the app took care of it, so thank you. Awesome. Great. <laughs> Uh, okay, and so a few questions here. So um, someone would like to know, we're interested in getting operators of small craft to report marine observations, specifically wave height. How large a vessel will give you accurate wave data? Also, can wave height be manually entered instead? I think you might have just answered. Yeah, so C state can be manually entered, and it would be great if people actually have those sensors on their boats to be manually entering them as a validation uh, measure for us. But um, the, the size of the craft is a good question because it's relative to the size of the waves. Um, in general, uh, a small craft on the order of 15 feet, 20 feet is would be fine. Uh, we're talking more about like a ferry or a yacht or a, um, you know, obviously like a cruise boat or something. Uh, those are all too big because they impose their, you know, it's just not a linear transfer between the wave and the, and the boat uh, oscillations. Um, so there is a way to do that, but it's much more complicated and is likely not, uh, not possible for us to infer enough about where the phone is on the craft in order to make that judgment. Okay, thanks. And this is actually the last uh, question for now, it looks like. So someone was following up on um, giving data to NWS, and they say that um, just FYI, Natus is collecting millions of hemp weather station data um, from CWOP and Weather Underground to NOAA. Uh, they suggest that weather citizens should support NWS, Skywarn, and I'm going to try and spell this out. Uh, C O C O R A H S reporting human observer bathymetry, uh, water depth. Oh, I, I don't. 
I don't know if that user is still listening, but when they say support, do they mean they want to see that on our map or they want our observations to go into Kokoros or the, the sky map? Yeah, I'm assuming they want it to be shared with these other networks that yeah. are widely used. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm taking a quick look at Eric here on my right and, and tasking him with, <laughs> with looking at what will be involved. I, I told you we got a team of collaborators here at Career working on this. So uh, we'll, we'll certainly take, start taking a look at, at that aspect. And, and again, uh, the app you know, just was released in the last couple months. Um, and we have about 10 months left of, of technical development. And so appreciate the, uh, the, the, the feedback and the questions. And hopefully, uh, um, some uh, we'll we'll get some users out there, and uh, you know, spread the word to others you think may be interested. Uh, certainly appreciate everybody's time today, and uh, hope hope to be in touch with with many of you in the future. All right, thank you so much, Mark and Jerry. Have a great day. You too. Thanks. <laughs>